papers. And last week we discussed how that the hearer has the, the idea, this in the, the Greek word that's used here, is that one who, who merely comes to hear, and that's as far as it goes for him. He doesn't have any intention to, to uh, make any difference in his life from what he learns and what he hears. And then the, 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 uh, James further goes on to say, it's like you go into a, you go into, uh, and look your, at yourself in a mirror, and when you step away, you forget immediately what you look like forgetting what any kind of improvements or changes you need to do with your hair or or whatever you need to do and and so that's and we can recall that Jesus likened what he likened that the one who puts in action who hears his word and and acts upon it it's like the the wise man who built his house upon the rock you know and so recognizing that Christ is our rock the word is a firm foundation um, <clears throat> and that when we we place our whole, I I guess the buzzword would be worldview, upon this, then uh, uh, it's like we're building a house upon the rock, and we are we are building upon a firm foundation, and we are a doer of the word of Christ and the word of God, and not just a hearer only. Uh, What are the implications? And this really is the, the crux of the matter, I think. Throughout James, we've discussed how this is, this is often referred to as the Proverbs of the New Testament. It is a practical guide. It is a practical uh, guidance we have to practical living, putting our beliefs in action. And here's how we do it. Some people say, I need application for my, my spiritual life. Here it is. Here it is. This is the practical application of my spiritual life. If you're looking to grow in the faith, if you're looking to affect your environment, the people around you, and, and, and uh, be that example for them to see the, the spiritual life, this is the practical application. Um, <clears throat> and it really comes down to and I, I think that it, it's, in fact, the whole of the scripture really is. But this particularly, that what is our faith? What is our faith? In other words, how sincere, how genuine are we? Uh, and, and so when I look at this, if one is a doer of the word, how sincere is he in his faith? Mm-hmm. But if one is just a hearer, how sincere is he in his faith? If all he does is hear and doesn't really, how can I say it? It's like, <laughs> imagine this. This is something I, uh, uh, that I imagine, and I don't, I think it is, it's applicable. You, you have your, your, your billboards out on the, on the uh, highway, and you know, when they, when they, they don't, they don't have painters anymore that come up and paint the, paint the billboards. They print everything at the shop, they bring out these sheets, and they have the, it's like wallpaper. They put the wallpaper, <laughs> the, the, the ads on the billboard, and they use paste and everything and put it up there. That's how I see as we take God's word, it's like we're cl- not merely pasting it. It's actually the implanted word, but it is, it's like we're placing it all over us. Okay? We're placing that word on our hearts, as it were. Okay? But in fact, the word is actually discussed as implanted word. And you know, we, we go back to the seed, the 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 parable of the sower and that the sower cast the seed out but the seed had to take root it had to be it can't couldn't just lay upon the surface what happened to the seed that just lay upon the rocky surface it didn't take root died and so that's how the word needs to act in our lives so one who merely hears the word what are his what's in store for him what is his future regarding his spiritual life and what will be the end result okay I asked this question what is the future for a spiritual life that of one who merely hears the word it's not gonna follow through is it it's it's um, <clears throat> and the result is what if one doesn't really live this what does Christ expect of us um, we, when the casual reader can even pick up on this, as he go, reads through the New Testament, 
he sees that a Christian is not one who merely calls himself a Christian. You know, we live in a, in a nation that a lot of people say this is a Christian nation. It's true that the initially our constitution and the laws that were enacted initially were all based upon scriptural concepts. Okay, private property, um, the the uh, liberty to choose your way, particularly to choose your way to worship God. Now I understand the Bi- there's one way to worship God that pleases God. I'm not saying that, but the fact that they defined that the government would not interfere with one's choice in worship meant that the worshiper could choose how he would worship. It meant he could choose to worship according to the scriptures. Okay, But all, all these things that, that the, the United States government was established in, in alignment with the principles that, that, are, that are seen in, in the uh, Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. And so, unfortunately, and well, and many of those that were involved considered themselves Christians. They were they be, were believers in Christ. Okay, and uh, you can read the the writings of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson. Um, some of them you can't because they're they're the, mo- um, the modernists or deists. But but many of them, as they wrote, they recognized the imp- not only the value but the importance of the study of the Word of God and the importance of God in our lives. Washington recognized himself how our republic, or it wasn't yet a republic, but he recognized when they were rebelling against England, against the king, that unless God is with us, we won't succeed. More importantly, unless we are aligned with God, we won't succeed. And, And you've heard this before, I'm sure, that it's not so much that God is with us as much as we are with God. Okay, so as and so you look at the, the beginnings of our nation and many of them, uh, what they had were the denominations. They were protesting the, the Catholic Church and so they separated themselves from the Catholic Church wanting to be the church that they read about in the Bible. They were wanting to reform the, the Catholic Church. And so, but as... Uh, what they had, they were believers in Christ. I'm sure that most were quite genuine and sincere. And so because of that, we, we've tagged on to this idea that the United States is a Christian nation. <coughs> but as we look at the scriptures more precisely, we recognize one is not a Christian who merely names the name. One is a Christian who lives it. Um... And so as we consider that one who really lives it is a real Christian, one who merely names a name, who's just a hearer, what is his future? What, what is his ultimate future when that day of cut judgment comes? Think about this. What is his ultimate future when the day of judgment comes for the mere hearer of the word? Will Christ be pleased? Will God be pleased? And so that, that, uh, that, I think, is what James is trying to bring to our attention, that you might have faith, but let's see it in action. And in fact, there's a whole chapter regarding it, chapter 2. And <clears throat> so when we see that we can't merely look into the law of liberty, the perfect law of liberty, we have to imbibe it. We have to drink of it. We have to put it in action and that's what he says and so in the in continuing with that thought in verse 26 if any man among you seem to be religious he means if anyone among you seems to yourself to be religious as you identify yourself are you religious and when you when he say religious meaning are do you have a right relationship with God and brideth not his tongue but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. So we see a connection here between as we look upon our own lives, and yeah, I'm religious, I believe in God, and I think I, I pretty much put his, his uh, concepts or his commands into practice. Okay? But what happens? And so as we see everything, and we know that the work of churches is manifold. There are v- so many things that, that involve. 
uh, the work of church. Of course, we recognize the importance and necessity of spreading the gospel, of teaching the lost. We understand the necessity of worshiping in truth and in spirit. We understand because of that, there are certain obli- because of our obligations to fulfill this commandment to assemble together, to get all together on the first day of each week, we need a place that we can. And so we, we uh, uh, obtain a building, but with that comes responsibilities to maintain that building. And so we recognize, so there are those who are involved with, with maintaining the building, um, <coughs> you know, a, a, a multitude of things. And then also the, the actions we have what, what, uh, in, in um, making our presence known. You know, we have a website, we have a, uh, uh, various advertisements, uh, advertisements we do, but all these things together, working together, there's so many things, and so you see people active. But there's one thing, as we look at this, if you consider yourself religious, but you don't bridle your tongue, that looks like it's something that it's, it can't be done without. That is, it is necess- necessary for us to bridle our tongue. If all the wonderful things that we do uh, for the work of the Lord, for the cause of Christ, and yet we don't bridle our tongue, look what does he say about this? But deceiveth his own heart. So as if I find myself I'm s- as active as I possibly could be in, in serving and 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 yet I don't control what I say, when I say it, where I say it, to whom I say it, then I'm fooling myself, thinking that I am religious. Okay. So, I, as, as, so James is really putting uh, the control of our own speech at a high level of qualifications, whether or not we re- really are religious, whether or not we really are in r- right with God. Because if we don't, we're deceiving ourselves. And the, the, the result is this man's religion is vain. You know, Jesus said, we will be judged by every idle word that, word that we speak. And so we need to uh, consider what James says regarding this as, as uh, this is an important aspect of our religiosity. And I don't mean that to, to demean, I mean true religion. In fact, the next verse pure religion this is so he's going to contrast here the vain religion with the pure religion and you know when we talk about purity it's it's 100 percent quality it's like when you have 99 you know you see these advertisements on on tv or wherever about these gold coins or silver coins you can purchase for as as a as a collector and it will increase its value and you look at the 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 purity of it they say 99.99 percent pure well that's if you had a, a kilogram of gold, which is a lot, <laughs> and, and it was 99.99% pure, that means, what would it be, 10 milligrams of it would not be gold out of that, telegra- out of that kilogram? Either 10 milligrams or 100 milligrams. It's a very, very small amount. That's how pure it is. So as we look at pure religion, how pure is it? And so James says, this is it. And undefiled before God. Undefiled meaning th- it's, of course, pure. It's not been spotted. Okay. And the father is this. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. And to keep himself unspotted from the world. Two aspects of, of pure religion. Of course, we go back to not forgetting, verse 26, the taming of our tongue, bridling our tongue. And then we add to this, Visiting the Father. And of course we know that visiting isn't merely going to see, say how to duty, right? Visiting is finding out what they need. And he says, to visit the fathers and widows in their affliction. We recognize that uh, the widows, that many of their husbands were quite smart and they set up uh, insurance policies and, and other me- uh, trusts and everything like that so that when they passed on, their wives their widows, and their children would be taken care of. Get, they would provide for them. And so there are many widows, and there were in that day as well, who had, uh, weren't in, they were not in affliction. They had what they needed to, to uh, supply themselves. Okay? But so James here is talking about those, the, widow, the fatherless and the widows. 
Okay. He didn't say orphans. We usually substitute orphans because they are fatherless. They're also motherless. But here's a case where he says fatherless, meaning in that day and age, in that economy, the father provided the, brought home the bacon, as it were. And we recognize, though, that, that there were women that were working. We look at Lydia. Remember who she was? Who was, who was Lydia? Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. So, so this Lydia, and it tells what she did, what she do for a living. She sold purple, purple dye. Purple dye is the royal color. To sell purple dye was like, you were, you were in a market that was very highly regarded because kings would purchase your products. And so if you would, of course, make your rounds, make your sales, and, and, and uh, uh, you're, you're involved with a very, I, I guess it was a profitable, profitable business because kings would be, want to be buying this purple dye, okay? Um, but so we understand that, that women were, were working as well. But uh, generally speaking, the, the, the uh, families rely upon the men of the family to, to supply them. So it's talking about the, those who were, could not supply for themselves. In the case of widows whose husbands had died, well, that's the term, that's the definition. But uh, that, uh, they, that these were people who couldn't fend for themselves. And so, and, it, and not only, in, and we look at the Old Testament as well and judgment and fair judgment and the kings were expected to uh, defend the defenseless the fatherless and the widows okay those who had they they were expected to be defended in matters of law because there were believe it or not there were unscrupulous individuals even during the old testament who would take advantage of 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 orphans and widows. And they would devour men's houses, or women's houses, I should say. We, we read about that, so the, some of the false prophets who who were uh, very deceptive in that they would enter into widows' houses and take advantage of their, their uh, through their smooth talk, take advantage of, of them and swaying them and devouring the whole house, as was he would. And and as I see it, it's it's very despicable in God's eyes to take advantage of, of these defenseless people like that. And so, um, as we look at pure religion to visit these, to, to make provisions for them in their affliction, there some, like, and there are some who are not afflicted, okay? The, the widows who are not afflicted, they're not, they're in the, in the b- uh, book of Acts when he talks about those widows, the Grecian widows and the Jewish widows, that the uh, Grecian widows were being uh, neglected, they weren't receiving what they needed, and so they, that's where they called for them to call among themselves seven men full of the Holy Spirit, and they assigned them the task of distribution for these necessities. But not all the widows who were there were in such, a, such, a, such an afflicted state. It was those who had the need. Okay. All right. And there's, uh, there's also a discussion about those widows that are indeed, who, would be, who should be enlisted as a widow indeed, and, and he gave the qualifications. All right. But the, the idea is, James is contrasting what is vain religion and what is pure religion. Are there any questions about what we've, we've talked about so far? Okay, and something like that? Okay. Okay. What? So they, they were providing for, they were active about it, so they were actually visiting them, right? That's something that we shouldn't neglect. Um, and we recognize, okay, um, that's what, when I talk about the widows indeed versus those widows who had or fine, that there's this distinction, but also in addition to that, the resources that any congregation may have may limit what they're able to do. Um, what a, I'm sorry? Go visit no, not just go visit them. No, that's, that's what I'm saying. Vi- to visit them is not just to say hi. Although we ought to, yes, we ought to vi- just, as we use the term today, casually visit for a social uh, visit. That, yes, we ought to. 
But what this is talking about is not mere visitation, going and saying hello. This is finding out what they need. Oh, okay. 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 Uh-huh. Okay. 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 It was a systematic approach, and it was it was thorough, wasn't it? Yes. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. I've seen I've seen where where like the uh youth group or the uh young prof- you know young professionals college college age people would get together and they would go to a widow's house do yard work visit things like that. Um You know, uh, you know as as I'm thinking about this I, and I think I ask myself okay wh- who are the widows here in this congregation? But he doesn't qualify that, does he? You know, I mean, he didn't say the widows of your congregation, but he does say widows, okay, and the orphans that we do. And, and we understand, okay, orphans, we have a general command or a general guidance. This says pure religion. And so if we want to be involved with pure religion, that we, we don't just limit, we, we understand orphans. We think about young orphans are not going to be Christians because they, they have not reached the age of accountability. That is, they're not required by God because they don't understand sin and its consequences. And so, so we recognize, okay, well, we, that's for general command, but what about the widows? Does that mean we only deal with the Christian widows? That's a question. What do we think about that? Do we only deal with Christian widows? Well, I know that Uh, let's see if I can find that. When Paul discusses the widows who really need to be put on the role of widows, I think it's... Um, first Timothy 5? I say it's first, first Corinthians, but you say First Timothy 5. Look at uh, 1 Timothy 5, verse 3. First Timothy 5, 3. And he's discussing honor widows that are widows indeed. What he means is who are really widows. That is, they're, they're destitute widows. Okay, and we know this because in verse 4, but if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Okay, um, let's talk about verse 4 for a little bit. You know, in the Old Testament, it talks about we are to honor our father and our mother. And so, usually we think about honor. We think we give them appropriate respect. And that's suitable, yes. But that's not the limitation of what, what God was talking about when we should honor our father and our mother. Um, because Jesus discussed was asking the Pharisees, were they, the, and Jenna, you might be able to help me with about the location. Okay. The, the, uh, the Pharisees were, were wondering, asking Jesus, why don't your disciples oh, uh, fulfill the commandments or, or the, 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 the traditions of our fathers? Because they wouldn't wash their hands before they ate. Yes, Adam? I'm sorry? Mark 7. Yes. Yes. Mark 7. That's exactly right. Uh, so what was going on there, Adam? What, what, was, what was the... Uh, he, Jesus asked him, why do you teach as the precepts of men as though they were the commandments of God? And he went on to say how they were doing it. And what were, what were they saying? What was the situation, Adam? Verse 10, for most said, honor your father and your mother, who 
Exactly. Short-circuiting, bypassing the commandment. They were, the commandment was in the Old Testament to honor your father and mother. And that the reason, and the consequence would be that you may live long upon this earth. Okay. Now, this is how I know that honoring our father and mother doesn't just mean we give them due respect. It includes it, but that's not it. This shows us that honoring our father and mother is a matter of going and finding out what they need and supplying their needs because as it was here, they, they were, the Pharisees were teaching that here's the deal. You come to me, you dedicate a certain amount of money or income or profit or whatever to get dedicated to the purpose for God. And then when you go home and your parents ask, are asking you, why aren't you honoring me? Why aren't you providing us? You, sit, you tell them, well, I've already dedicated that money. It's to the purpose of God. And that, therefore, whatever I would have given to you, I've already dedicated to God. And so this arrangement was short-circuiting God's command to honor their father and mother. That means honoring their father and mother meant providing for their needs, physical needs. Okay. Um, Yeah, yeah, being seen of men, right? So, so as we look at honoring their father and mother, it was more than just, just that. So when we go back to First uh, Timothy chapter 5 again, honoring widows that are widows indeed, that means providing for their needs, their physical needs. Uh, but he's, but here's, his ca- here's the thing. If any widow has children or nephews who can provide for their needs to honor their father and their mother, they need to be doing it so that the church is not doing it. Okay. Um, it's, ex- it's, it's good and acceptable before God. Now in verse 5, now she that is a widow indeed, now here's the definition, and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. That's a qualification for a, w- a widow indeed. So, uh, okay, that tells me a widow indeed is a Christian woman. Now she is, okay, um, but she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Okay. Uh, so it's contrasting this woman who's spiritual, who con- dedicates herself to following God, continuing in prayers. Contrast that with the woman who's, who uh, is worldly. The woman who's worldly liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And these things give in charge that they, be, uh, that they may be blameless. Okay, so, so the qualification here of a widow indeed and the, how we are instructed, how we are to, to honor them, that is how to provide for them, there is a qualification. Number one, a widow indeed might have other means. Their children or their nephews, okay? And so that is, that is as it falls upon them to, uh, to provide them their means. But then a woman, who is de- a, a woman who is a widow indeed, who is also desolate, has no ways, she trusts in God. So these are, these are the women we have an obligation from James to, to visit the, the widows, the fatherless and the widows, okay? So then... If there are women in that state who fit this qualification, we have an obligation to be sure that, that uh, we visit them. That's pure religion and undefiled before God. You're right. You're right. Going back to James, going back to James, uh, verse twenty, uh, chapter one, verse twenty-seven, to visit the fatherless and the, w- and the widows. The fatherless, and like I say, we usually we usually fill in the word orphans. That fits, but it's not the total. And so they say, be, and so there are some who will say, well, this home is not an orphans' home because they don't take orphans, n- only orphans. They take anyone who any child who is uh, in a situation that uh, they can't take care of themselves and, and, and their family situation is so awful that they can't survive it, okay? You'll, you'll see that children are taken by the state 
into custody and to take the children into custody in the state to, to provide for them. They've, you're familiar with the foster home system. But also there are homes that are operated by, uh, I should say they're, they're, they're partially supported by churches of Christ. And then we also contribute to these, okay? But some congregations will say, well, this is not an orphan's home, so therefore we're not obligated to take care of that. And some even go so far as that, well, this is a private thing that, that this is not required by the church to do. This is for the individual. There's a problem with that argument because this isn't identifying it at all. In fact, we go back to how the, the first uh, chapter, Acts, uh, the book of Acts, where they did. The church did take care of the widows, okay, and uh, the the fact that uh, one would try to justify their not taking care of widows and orphans by saying they don't fit the bill. In the case of the the orphans' homes, uh, they aren't orphans' homes, therefore we're not obligated. They're forgetting something. Pure religion undefiled before God. And, and when we look at these, qualif- these classifications, widows and, the, and the, the, uh, fatherless, the fatherless and the widows, these people are who are desolate, have no way, and the, the Galatians teaches us to, as we have opportunity, to, go, to go, do good unto all men, especially they have the household of faith. Right? So here's what I'm getting at, that we don't have a program to uh, take care of widows I am in no way justifying that we don't have a WIP program. But on the, other, on, the, on the same page that we don't have widows that fit that qualification means we, we, uh, we can't do what's not there. You know what I mean? If there are no widows, we can't, we can't, can't, can't take our widows. Hmm? Widows, no widows... Uh, I don't. Uh, do you know of a widow in this congregation? Yeah, I'm sorry. She is a. Okay. 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 That's what this teaches, isn't it? And it's not, we can, we can talk a lot about it in class unless we do it. That's what this is about, unless we do it. Note taken. Note taken. Now, okay, as we continue with pure religion, that's the whole point. This is fathers and affliction, and fathers and widows and affliction, and to keep one's himself unspotted from the world. That, I mean, we, do we need to define that? The only thing I think we need to talk about is de- deceiving ourselves that I'm not unspotted from the world. <laughs> really? I mean, I mean that's, that's really it, right? Uh, we know that we can deceive ourselves from, from the uh, verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious, and, uh, but deceiving his own heart. Okay, we can deceive ourselves in our own mind, our own way of thinking to think that, yeah, I'm fine. Uh, but uh, we need to look at ourselves. We need to look at the perfect law of liberty and make adjustments where they are where they need to be made. Okay, chapter two. Any other thoughts or questions about what this re- in this regard? Okay. Okay, my brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. So this is continuing on with thought of looking to the perfect law of liberty, not deceiving ourselves, but doing, being doers of the word and not hearers only. Don't take preference, don't 
give preferential treatment to the various brethren, based, particularly based upon their, um, their relative income, their relative wealth. Have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons. As, as we consider, have not the faith. Don't turn our faith in, how can I say it? It was, it was so w- well stated in, in some of the commentaries I read. Don't let the faith that we have, or the faith of Christ, be such that we treat others preferentially. Okay. Or dispreferentially. That's not a word, but it's <laughs> the, uh, you understand the idea. And so our faith in Lord Jesus can't have anything to do with special treatment. You remember Paul when he, when he was relating to events in his life in Galatians and how he received the word, the gospel, not from men, but from, from Christ himself. And that even to the point where he's talking about his activities, and he, when in Antioch, he, he saw Peter acting hypocritically. You remember when, 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 uh, he, when Peter was, was with the congregation, mainly Gentiles, he, he was living among them friendly and, and socializing. He was in fellowship with them as he ought to have been. But when Jewish friends came down from Jerusalem, for whatever reason, he began to draw himself away from the Gentiles to spend time with the Jews. And not so much that it's, it's wrong that we should have special friends or enjoy time with, with uh, uh, various people, but the fact that Peter was withdrawing himself because of perhaps pressure, social pressure, or, or the feeling that he might himself be judged by his Jewish friends so that he was actually separating himself from the Gentiles, the Gentile brethren. And not only that, the example that Peter set was also causing the other Jews to separate too. So Peter was not only sinning himself, but setting a very poor example, especially for an apostle. And uh, so Paul wrote that he confronted him before his face. He stood condemned before God because he was, have, he was giving pressure, preferential treatment based on social class. Actually, not social class, rather on, I don't think it was racial discrimination, but rather it was national. It was, it was identifying by nationality, I guess you might say. Um, his friends from, the, from Jerusalem. Okay, and this was sinful. And so this follows with, we can't treat the brethren with any kind of prefer- preferential treatment. Every one of us are as important to God as the other. And to realize that, that if we start to show favoritism to certain brethren, that we are sinning because we are, we are ag- against God and his intents. We, should all, we are all one in Christ. And if we show favoritism to one because of, in this case, their uh, wealth, the display of wealth. But in other, there are other instances, whether it be racial, whether it be social, whether it be professional, whatever it is, there's no place for it. Um, and so he, as we go on, and, and so our faith, we shouldn't reduce our faith to this. That's, what I get, that's the, the best way I can say it. Don't reduce our faith in Christ to behaving like we would in the world. Let's say verse 2, For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come also a poor man in vile raiment. Vile meaning just uh, humble. Um, let's see. Um, uh, filthy clothes. Okay. You know, you, you can go to some rural areas where there are a bunch of farmers or ranchers, you know, and they, they're, they've spent all day out in the field, whether they're plowing the field or whether they're, they're rope, uh, branding their cattle. I know, it's the, I'm not sure how they do these things these days in the modern 21st century. But when they come in off the field and they don't have time to clean up before they go to Bible class on Wednesday night and they come in with their blue jeans and coveralls and they're all dusty and all that, and they, they come to join the brethren in Bible, Bible class. You, that's filthy garments, right? It's all dusty and all dirty. And so you say, well, sit in the back while they have the nice clean folks and the, smell, and the nice smelling people up front. And, the, and the <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? That's what James is saying. We don't treat each other based upon how they're dressed in this. 
uh, bec- um, as we look at the individuals, um, we'll sa- have more to say in a minute. And ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou here and sit here under my footstool. Are you not then partial in yourselves, or become judges of evil thoughts? Aren't you, aren't you uh, gravitating to the level of the world? Because that's exactly how people treat others in this world. They, um, they look at the fine clothes and the gold ring. Ah, he's refined. And so we treat him specially. But then we look at the other who's um, wearing the best he can. And it's not, we might say it's not up to standards. you know. And so we treat him with disrespect. James says this is a sin. Now, there is a difference. Well, let me say this too before I get there. Um, James is not saying that we need to treat with disrespect those that are well off either. We needed to love the brethren, to treat all with love and encouraging one another and with the same love for all and warmth, okay? Uh, and so, I mean, sometimes we might look at this, well, I can't treat the, the well-off people as well as well anymore, so I've got to turn them off and treat the other, the, other <laughs> the uh, not so well-off to do uh, specially, okay? That's not what he's saying either. We're tre- treat one another all specially, okay? Now, there is a difference between those that can't do any better than what they do. And I, that's what James is talking about. Those who can't do better, any better than what they do, when they come in there off the field or they, if they, they don't have the means to uh, buy the latest clothes and things like that. That's what he's talking about. But it's not the one who decides it doesn't matter what I wear, I'll just come as I am. That's a different thing altogether. We talk about, as we come together, f- the, the clothing we wear, and we have the means to provide, uh, buy ourselves these clothes, right? The clothing we wear reveals something about us. The clothing we wear, first of all, reveals our respect of ourselves. People take us seriously when we take ourselves seriously. People take us seriously when we dress in a way that shows that we respect ourselves. But it also shows our respect for others, We respect others in that we think highly enough of them that we will dress in a way that they are comfortable with, that they they feel like, I want to be here with you, and I'm not going to just wear rags before you. I'm going to show you you're important to me. And I want to show you, I want to encourage you to be the best you can be for Christ. And so it shows the respect we have for others, the way we dress the way we groom ourselves, everything like that. Also, and most importantly, it shows the respect and reverence we hold for God, our Father, in Christ. As we, as we come to the assembly or we come to the Bible classes, we, that, that God wants us to encourage one another, it goes without saying. I mean, it goes with saying, actually. But we understand the import of encouraging our brethren, but also that we think enough of God, highly enough that, we show him the best we have. You, you, you recognize that in the Old Testament that the priests all had their garments that were specially sewn and, and, and fabricated and all the designs. And that wasn't just for looks. It was about they are priests of God. They were servants of God to do his will, to do his bidding, to, do, uh, to worship him. And they would dress appropriately for that purpose. And as we take that principle from the Old Testament, not, not that we're bound by the Old Testament law, we certainly don't have robes and garments. You know, we don't wear robes. That's rather ostentatious, I would think. And so we take that principle though, of presenting ourselves before God as, as uh, you know, at, uh, our best. We want to present ourselves in a way that shows respect for him 
shows respect for our brethren and respect for ourselves. So James is not talking about that, that we would have brethren who can't do all, wear all the nice clothes. That's who he's talking about. Okay. All right. That's, I better stop here. Uh, we'll, we'll, um, beginning, we'll take, re review verse four. We'll begin in verse five next week. Appreciate your comments. Appreciate, I really do.